want to welcome to the 11:30 Wednesday lunch and Bible study from Doctrine of Studies Bible Church in Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, today we're going to study the fourth foundational doctrine of the Holy Spirit taught by Jesus uh, during the Last Supper period. That would be John 13 through 17. And specifically, he talks about, now he, he spoke, he taught a lot of Bible doctrine, a lot of categorical doctrine during that period. The one I'm focusing on is the foundation doctrines of the Holy Spirit. He began teaching that in John 14, 16, and 17. In John 14, 16, 17, he laid down the first foundational doctrine, which was the indwelling of the, of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. He said that when he would take up residence, when the Holy Spirit would come, he would take up residence inside the body of church-age believers under the new covenant. And he said when he came in John 14, 16, 17, he said when he came, he would, he would dwell there forever. Not going, once he comes in, he's not going anywhere. He's not, he's not permitted to go anywhere. In 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, he says when he takes up residence in a church-age believer's life, his, the church-age believer's body becomes the temple of God, a place where God dwells. It's a holy temple. It's a naos. It's a holy temple. Uh, because of the blood of Christ has cleansed it, and the Holy Spirit, third member of the Godhead, lives there. Lives there. It's his residence. It's his address. And he's never permitted to leave you. You might leave him, but he can never leave you, it, it, we might say. Now, the second, in John 14, the second foundational doctrine he taught was teach and recall down there in verse 25 and 26, when the Holy Spirit would come, dwell inside us, one of the indwelling ministries would be to teach us and recall the teaching of the truth of the Word of God for our life. And so that's another ministry, teach and recall. Now, he's going he's gonna to put it in here. You're going to believe it. Once you believe it, it's in your heart and he's going to be able to call it, call it out at any time he needs to do that. Teach and recall. It's his ministry. You need to be an open vessel to that. You've got to have positive volition. You've got to, you've got to put your head in the word so God can put the word in your heart. Once it's in your heart, then the Holy Spirit, who has taught it to you, can experience it in your life when all of a sudden God, you're in some, some situation and, and the Holy Spirit just recalls something to your mind and you're amazed that, that you remembered that. Well, that's part of that teach and recall ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit. It's part of his ministry responsibility. Then we come to the 15th chapter, 25 through 27, and it says the third foundational doctrine that Jesus thought important to teach his disciples was what's called the testimony of the indwelling Holy Spirit, that he would testify. He would testify of Christ, both in his, his coming and his reason to die on a cross, be buried and raised, so that people could be saved by grace through faith and not of themselves. It would be a gift from God. The John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. What was that? To die on the cross for our sins so that they could be removed by the grace principle by the death of Jesus Christ, his blood, that he would be buried and raised on the third day to give his eternal life. And, and that's the testimony. It's a testimony of why Christ came into the world. It's a testimony of what he's doing today, as seated at the right hand of God, exal exalted and seated at the right hand of the Father in heaven during the church age. He's the head of the church and the savior of the body. Uh, therefore, he's the key guy for the whole church age under the new covenant. And the Holy Spirit will teach us that, and then we'll be able to give testimony to other people based on the word of God and how we've, how we've learned that and why it's so important to their life. And so that's the testimonial uh, ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit. Today, we come to the fourth foundational doctrine, which is the conviction of the world. He has a conviction of the world. It's important you understand what is the base of the operation of the Holy Spirit in the church age, the life of a believer. He indwells the body. 1 Corinthians 6, 
19 and 20. What? Don't you know that your body has become the temple of God, the sacred place for dwelling of the, of, the, of the Godhead? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit is actually a resident inside your body, not a visitor, a resident. He's not permitted to leave once he enters, and he enters at the point of salvation, the moment you believe that Jesus died for your sins and was buried and raised from the dead to give you eternal life. He becomes a, a permanent resident inside your body, and he has a complete ministry operation out of your body. That's important you understand that, and and. And out of that comes this conviction world, of, uh, conviction of the world. He's going to operate conviction of the world out of your life. And he says there's three areas. Sin, concerning sin, concerning righteousness, and concerning judgment. So let me read that, John 16, 7 through 11. Here's what it says. I tell you the truth. That's a special phrase. Anytime you hear Jesus say that, it ought to be highlighted because he's going to talk about a specific doctrine that's important to every believer in the church age. I tell you the truth. A lot of times he'll say, verily, verily, I say unto you, it is to your advantage that I go away. He's going to leave the earth and go back to heaven. And it's an advantage to us. Think about that. For if I do not go away, the helper shall not come to you the helper being the Holy Spirit indwelling. But if I go, I will send him to you. And there's a promise. And he, the Holy Spirit, when he comes, where is he going to come? Inside the moment you believe the gospel that Christ died for your, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, he came to die for our sins, to be buried, to be raised from the dead on the third day, to give us eternal life, the abundant life, the life of God. Well, it says, and when he comes, point of salvation, where does he come? Inside my body. His residence, the address of the Holy Spirit in the church age is the, is the body of a believer. He will come. He will convict the world concerning sin. Now, who is he convicting? The world. Who is the world? John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that whosoever would believe in God, he sent his son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. The world are those people that are under, still under Adamic sin. We're all born under Adamic. Every human being is born under Adamic sin. Hebrews, the 12th chapter, we all are bastards or illegitimate children. Our, our father ancestry is Adam, the first Adam. Jesus Christ is the last Adam. And when you, when you believe in him, that he came and died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead third day, you, you get born again. You get born into the family of God. Through the last Adam, 1 Corinthians 15, 45, the first Adam brought sin and death. The last Adam brought righteousness and life, 1 Corinthians 15, 22. It's important that you understand that, that all people are born in Adam's sin, Romans 5, 12 through 21. Wherefore, as by one man, Adam, sin entered into the world and death by sin. And so it passed upon all mankind for all have sinned in Adam. You've got to understand that. You're under 13 judicial charges of Adamic sin. Spiritually dead, spiritually blind. You know, you, you go to our website and read about that. You have to understand the judicial charges of Adam's sin that we're under. Just read the book of Romans. At least read the first five chapters. Well, so conviction of sin. Now he talks about conviction of sin, righteousness, and judgment. He says, verse 9. Now, concerning sin, because they do not believe in me, righteousness, because I go to the Father and you no longer behold me, judgment, concern, this is of the world. Now, remember, of the world. <laughs> My goodness, I, I told you that in verse 8. 
Now, concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged. Who is the ruler of this world? Well, he's, he talked about it in John 12, 31, Satan. He talked about it in John 14, 30, Satan. And he's talking about it again in the 16th chapter, verse 11. We'll talk about it more. I'm just, I'm just giving you a heads up on it. Now, the Bible, I need to get to my lesson. The Bible, I've just read it. The Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people for spiritual living. Can't learn it nor live it in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 3. What must I do? To get out of carnality and back into spirituality, which is the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit, spirituality. The Christian life has been saved to be spiritual. It is spiritual because the Holy Spirit dwells in it. Spiritual, the word is spirit. If you don't have the Holy Spirit, you can't be spiritual. It's not your religious works that make you spiritual. It is the presence and dynamics of walking in the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit. Galatians 5, 16 and 17. How do I get out of carnality, evidenced by personal sin, back into the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit? He didn't leave me in this period. He's still there, but he's, he's, he's not functional because I've turned off the switch. I chose to sin. Volitionally, I chose to sin. I have to choose to confess my sin to get back into spirituality. Has the Holy Spirit left me? No, he can't. John 14, 16 says he can't leave you. That's a permanent address for him, the life of a believer. So what do I have to do? How do I get out of carnality back to spirituality? 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faith, confess our, name it, cite the sin. He's faithful and just forgive me and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Cleansing takes us back to the cross where the blood of Christ has been shed with, with two ideas in mind, one for the unbeliever who's under the 13 judicial charges of Adam's sin. He's born a sinner. You got to be born again to be a saint. Got to be born again. It's a grace principle. A grace principle that you're a saint. It's a, it's a position in Christ. You're sanctified. Positionally sanctified. So when you believe the gospel of Christ, 13 judicial charges are removed and you receive 50 things that you can never lose in time and eternity. Go to our website, doctoralstudies.com, and you can read all this. You need, to, you need to stick your head in the Word so He can stick it in your heart so the Holy Spirit can minister it. Because that's where He resides in your life, in your body. But for the Christian, the one who has believed the gospel, for him, you see, when he confesses a sin, the blood of Christ works for spirituality, remove, removes you out of carnality and into spirituality. So I give you a moment. Confess your sins. Could be mental attitude sins, sins of the tongue, or avert sins. You've got to take responsibility. If your priesthood responsibility is confess sin. Confess it directly to the Father, directly through, the, through Christ. Father, we thank you today for these that have come here with us to study the Word of God. I pray the Holy Spirit would minister to those who are in our periphery, and those who are beyond it to the uttermost parts of the earth who have found us, who have found us in God faithfully teaching and will bring enlightenment to their life and revelation for their soul in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to talk about four things today. The first thing I want to talk about is the Greek word and the idea behind conviction. And so point, my point number one be the, the Greek word for conviction is, is an interesting word. In the Greek, literal Greek language, it is spelled E-L-E-G-C-H-O. But because some of the theons of the Greek language, the G is changed to an N in the English, and so you will often find this word spelled E-L-E-N-C-H-O, Enlenko. Yeah. Elenko is a word that 
I want to give you the very root meaning of the word. The, the root meaning of the word, it means to expose and to lay bare the facts of truth. Conviction. Now, as a Greek student, you always go to a great lexicon, and for me, uh, that would be Arnsen and Gingrich. And, and so I gave you on page 248 in the Greek-English lexicon of the New Testament, I gave you their four ideas into the English idea. They say, number one, that this word conviction means to bring light or expose something and set it forth, to expose and set forth something. An example of that would be Ephesians 5, 11, and 13. <clears throat> the idea that I'm after, uh, they list as convict, convince, or point out someone of something. Point out something to someone. That's in our passage, John 16, 7 through 11, where the word conviction means that. Also, number three, they say this word uh, carries the idea in the English other than conviction. It means to reprove, rebuke, or correct. Used in Matthew 18, 15, uh, 1 Timothy 5, 20, and 2 Timothy 4, 2. Their fourth idea behind this word means to heighten, punish, or discipline, used in Hebrews, the 12th chapter, verse 5, Revelation 3, 19, just as examples. Now, the idea that we're after in this, and so this word, my point is, this word could be used by these different uh, labels in the English. The word convict is not, this word uh, elenco may not always be the word convict. But in our passage, it certainly is, and translated into the English language of which I teach, uh, it is consistent. And so it's in our passage. So th that's number one. Remember, the root idea is to expose, remember this, to expose and to lay bare the facts of truth, doctrinal truth. Conviction or convincing. Conviction or convincing. Point number two. I just wanted to give you an idea of the background of the word. Point number two. Jesus used three special phrases to reveal categorical Bible doctrine during this last supper period regarding the completion of his mission on earth uh, to the advent of the coming of the Holy Spirit. He uses in the Last Supper discourse, and I'm just going to mention a few places, he uses a phrase called these things. In John 14, 15, and 16, which is immense where he really got heavy into doctrine, uh, categorical doctrine, of which one of them we're talking about the foundation doctrines of the Holy Spirit. Jesus used this phrase. He used it 10 times in, in 14, 15, and 16. For example, in the 14th of 1 John 14, verse 25, 26, in the 15th chapter, verse 11 and 21, in the 16th chapter, the chapter we're in, he used it in verse 1, 3, 4, used it twice in 4, 6, 25, and 33. And he used it to keep the disciples' attention towards the categorical Bible doctrines he was teaching them. And he was teaching them a lot of different doctrines. And they were all pertaining to the ministry, the, the ministry mission that Jesus had in the first coming. Why did he come to earth? What what would what what was his primary purpose? What was his secondary purpose? Primary purpose is to die on a cross. Secondary is to attract Israel to understand that he was the long-awaited Messiah. 
and that he was the savior of the world, not just the Jewish nation. He was the savior of the world. And he, he told the Samaritan woman that he was, a, he was the savior of the world. And so he was. For example, in, in John 15, 11, let me show you this. In John 15, 11, these, for example, when you, when you watch for these things, you want to pay attention to them. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy might be made full. Think about that. That's just one of those things. And he was teaching on how not to lose your joy and how your joy can be made full. Because the, the disciples, the more he talked about leaving them, the more sorrowful their hearts became. And joy was a great teaching uh, part doctrine. It was a great doctrine that he was trying to teach to try to get them to combat sorrow and grief. I, I'm, just, I'm just giving you kind of examples. Um, in 16.1, uh, in he says, these things, remember that's what I was talking about, these things I have spoken to you, I have taught you, that you, may, that you may be kept from stumbling. Now, he was teaching them categorical doctrine to keep them from stumbling in their faith. Like, like he said to Peter in um, Luke 22, 31, 32, when he said, Satan has sought permission to sift you like wheat, but I've prayed that your faith not fail you. And I have prayed that you will work your way through the failure of your faith to be restored to your faith so that you can strengthen the brethren, that you can carry that message forward. You should read 2 Corinthians, the third chapter, where he talks about the comfort of suffering. Well, these things. The second phrase that you pay attention to is the phrase, his hour. In John, the 12th chapter, 23 and 24, in the 13th chapter, verse 1, in the 16th chapter, he gets heavy with it again. Verse 2, 4, 25, 32, and in the 7th chapter, verse 1, Jesus uses this phrase, his hour or the hour, to refer to his, his death, crucifixion, his burial on third day, raised resurrection, and exaltation to the right hand of God the Father in heaven, during what we call the church age of the new covenant. In John 17, 1, Jesus said, he spoke these things. After speaking those things, he lifted his eyes to heaven and prayed, the hour has come. Glorify your son that the son may glorify you. John 17 is that Gethsemane prayer time. There is a third phrase that you look for when you study the passages. These are, are key, key phrases that he keeps using over and over. And after a while, you should be get, go like, why does he keep saying uh, these things? Why does he keep saying the hour, my hour? And the third one, a little while. In John 14, uh, 19 and 20, he uses this word a little while that I'm going to call your attention to. In John 16, 16 through 22, Jesus used this phrase, a little while. I'm going to be with you a little while, then I'm going away. It upset them. It upset them. And why is he using uh, these phrases? Why is he doing it this little while? To teach the nearness of the time of the completion of his earthly ministry and his departure for a heavenly ministry, and the nearest of the and the nearness of the advent or the coming of the Holy Spirit. This is what he's talking about in our passage and what he would do. When you read the 16th chapter of John, you're going to find this phrase little while. Watch how many times he uses it in our chapter. A little while and you will no longer behold me. And again, a little while and you will see me. 
Some of his disciples says, I, 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 I don't get it. What is this that he's t trying to tell us? A little while and you will not behold me. And again, a little while and you will see me because I go to the Father. Uh, I'm not getting it. What is this that he says? A little while. We do not know what he's talking about. Jesus knew, knewing what they wished to question him, wished that they wished to question him, said to them, are you deliberating together about this that I said a little while and you will not behold me and again a little while and you will see me? Truly, truly, I say to you, boom. You think any of them, you think any of them wrote it down and said, would you repeat that again? And said it again, would you repeat that? Do you think they got it? Now they didn't get it, but they should have because this is a phrase that says you ought to be writing this down. This is going to be on a coming test soon. Truly, truly, I say to you that you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned to joy. See, he's talked about this. He's been talking about this all through this, this last supper. Then he goes on to give an illustration about it and to talk about how to deal with sorrow and grief. Just in case you might be going through it yourself. But he used this idea a little while. He used it in verse 16. He used it in 17, 18, 19. In 19, he used it twice. I mean, that's a lot. All right, that's a whole lot. Here's, here's point number three on the conviction of the world, the convicting world ministry of the Holy Spirit to the world. In John 16, 1 through 15, Jesus taught the fourth foundation doctrine of the Holy Spirit, our lesson today, 7 through 11. He's going to teach the fifth foundational doctrine in the 16th chapter, verses 12, 13a. And he's going to teach the sixth foundational doctrine in the 16th chapter, verses 13b through 15. It teach. So he's, he's, he's ramping it up, the teaching on the Holy Spirit, because he's about to go to get Gethsemane, have his prayer, be arrested, tried, and crucified. The hour is getting close to time. Today we introduce this lesson on the conviction of the Holy Spirit with the key phrase that Jesus uses to call our attention to something doctrinally very important. But I say to you, the first part of this is really important. He says, it's to your advantage that I leave the earth. Now think about that. You are better off today with Jesus in heaven seated, exalted with authority than on earth. Because you have a double advocacy. You have a double comforter. You have one seated at the right hand of God the Father, your advocate of 1 John 2, 1 and 2. And you have the Holy Spirit as your great comforter residing can never leave you on earth. Think about that. Now, not only do you have him seated at the right hand of God the Father, who is the head of the church and savior of the body, and the great comforter, always there for you, understands what you're going through in your humanity, but you have the Holy Spirit that can never leave you, that has to work you through it, and is there to help you. He's your helper, helper. <laughs> He's your helper. He's your helper. But I tell you the truth, Jesus said, it's to your advantage that I go away. Now, he uses something really interesting. Now, watch this. He uses two ifs. They're third-class conditions. Maybe yes, maybe no. It's volitional. And volition is involved in it. And the sovereignty of God's plan. Now, watch this. For if I do not go away, in other words, this whole thing I'm teaching is contingent upon me going away. 
the helper, the Holy Spirit who's going to come and reside inside your life, the third member of the Godhead, the helper will not come to you. If this doesn't happen, this will not happen. It's to your advantage that it, it goes this way because that's the sovereign will of God. Now watch, watch what else he says. But if I go, which is the whole key, he's going to leave the earth and go back to heaven. But he's not going to leave you orphans. He's not going to leave you alone. He's going to send back the Holy Spirit. If I go, I will send him to you, and that's an absolute promise. Did Jesus leave the earth? Did he go back and sit at the right hand of God the Father? Yes, he did. So what's the promise? That he would send you the Holy Spirit. Now, literally, to the disciples, it's going to be at Pentecost. For us, Pentecost is where this whole thing began, so that when we came along and believed the gospel, we got it immediately. Listen, you get the moment you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ because you live in the church age under a new covenant, you get eight works of the Holy Spirit and salvation by the grace of God, not by works. And, and when you get them, they're forever. One of those is the indwelling. One of those eight is the indwelling. All eight of them are permanent. Where can I find that? On our website, doctorstudies.com. This is not the first time we've ever taught this. There's no telling how many times we've taught this. Just from different passages and different books. They all stay consistent. And when you step back and take a look at these, you're going to see that there's alternatives. You see, watch this. If I do not, and if I do, if I do not go, and if I do go, you're benefited. It's to your advantage. You're benefited. How are you benefited? He tells you how. My, 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 could be a gate question. The helper will not come to you, but if I go, I will send him to you. It's second person plural. The you in the literal text is the 120 in Acts 1.15 followers of Christ who are waiting for Pentecost to come to be baptized with the Holy Spirit to institute the establishment of the ministry of the Holy Spirit and the beginning of the church. That's where it began. It began at Pentecost with the, with the advent of the Holy Spirit. Well, my, my, I don't know. The you was the 120 believers waiting for the advent of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, Acts 1, 5, 15, second chapter, verse 1, which is the fulfillment of Matthew 3.11. Matthew 3.11, the fulfillment of it is Pentecost. You know what? Listen, let me just take a break here with you in a moment. Let me, let me just talk to you. I know you've probably never heard teaching like this. And my heart hurts for you for that. You should be able to go to a church, sit down, and have a guy crank it out to you. Teach you categorical Bible doctrine that you can grow and, and glow and the Holy Spirit can teach and recall and other people can be benefited by it. It's to your advantage. It's to their advantage. It's to your advantage. When you take advantage of the advantage, other people will take it from you and you will gladly give it by grace to them. But listen to me now. You've got to stick your head in the word of God so that the Holy Spirit can stick it Stick the word of God in your heart so he can teach and recall it. You don't study the Bible enough under, under a teacher. Now, a lot of you read the Bible every day and don't get, a, don't get a thing from it. You've got to get information. You've got to get categorical Bible doctrine. What's the Bible say about this? What's the Bible say about that? 
all these questions in your life, what does the Bible say, should be able to be answered on a consistent basis by you sitting in a teaching church. If you can't find one, you found one. If, if you live within 40 miles, you should drive here. You should come at least to the Sunday service till we can get over this COVID restriction business. We meet at 930. We meet for one hour, one hour, whatever, a little bit goes over right now. You can pick us up on the website. You can go to the website. You can study all day long. My, my, my. Look at it. And listen, you got to have an appetite for that. Jesus is seeking those who are hungry and thirsty for righteousness. You're not going to find righteousness. You're not going to find it positionally or experientially apart from the Word of God and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. You've got to take this stuff serious in your life. Listen, you know what you should take more serious than the COVID? is the Word of God. Listen, there's always diseases... There's always something out there that the devil is able to rattle the cage and said, oh, you'll die from this. Listen, you're not going to die from anything. If you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you're going to die because God appoints your death. It's a time to be born, a time to die. It's, it's in the sovereign plan of God. And it don't matter what you die from. Listen, you're not going to die from sin. Not at the appointed time. Not at the appointed time. Yeah, you're going to die. The, you could die the sin unto death, but look. You're still going to go to heaven. That's not the point. The point is, what is your life? What impact is your life having? What impact is your life having? Listen, what impact is the indwelling Holy Spirit having on your life? How important is walking in the Spirit to your life to control the flesh? How important is walking by faith in the Word of God in your life rather than by sight? I mean, is this not an awareness in your life every day, how you walk? I'm just saying it ought to be. We teach here for it to be. The dynamics of Christ, not just saving you, but the dynamics of Christ who, is, who has established the great ministry of the Holy Spirit, who takes the word of God and just does phenomenal things, not only to your spiritual growth, but to your spiritual ministry. My, my, my. It's the most exciting thing I've ever got my life involved in. I can't imagine living any other way. It's not because I'm a pastor. That's a gift. I have the teaching gift. That's all I've got. I have this. I've had this since my conversion, since I found Christ through faith, through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And fell in love with the whole grace principle of living rather than by the law. Let me close. Point number four, the, convicti the conviction ministry of the Holy Spirit of John 16, 7 through 11 will begin at Pentecost of Acts 2 and will continue until the rapture of the church, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18, as one of many passages. When we examine the convicting ministry of the Holy Spirit of John 16, 7 through 11, at least in my mind, I see it broke down into two parts. And so I want to use two homiletical points in closing. In verse 7, I see that Jesus taught the advantage to our life of the Holy Spirit. The advantage of having the Holy Spirit and not Jesus. The advantage of having the Holy Spirit in the dynamics of my life. 
When Jesus was on earth, he could only be at one place at one time with one group of people. When you, when you, when you read the scriptures of the gospels, you understand that. But the Holy Spirit dwells as a complete entity of identity in every believer everywhere in the world at the same time. <laughs> you talk about the more, you know God has to have a sense of humor because you know that drives the devil nuts. If there's one thing about the church age that drives the devil nuts, it would be that. I mean, he could, he could have a detached group of, of demons always, always wherever Jesus was, wherever he was going, and he did to harass him. Because he's going to be at one place at one time, yada, yada. You know, that's because of his humanity. The Holy Spirit. <laughs> I speak... To you who are listening to me in Alabama, Georgia, state, the, wherever you are in the United States, and to those nations overseas that have found us, we're all indwelt by the Holy Spirit who brought conviction to our life out of the world and has now put that conviction in us to go to the world as ambassadors of Christ with the gospel of the good news. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? It drives the devil nuts. I mean, he, he is spread so thin. His army of fallen angels and demonic forces, if you want to read about it, go to Ephesians 6, uh, 10 through 17. Put on a spiritual armor and fight him. He's spread so thin to try to keep up with everything. <laughs> I love the thought. I mean, I love the thought. Well, when we look at this, we see, number one, in, ver in verse 7, John 16, the advantage of the Holy Spirit, it is to your advantage present active indicative, that I go away, that I go away. In John, the 14th chapter, verse 12, just to carry this idea of the Holy Spirit as a complete person in every believer in the church age, everywhere in the world at the same time. When you, when you read, and I, and I, and I it drives the devil nuts. I, look how thin his military has to be thinned out to station over everybody everywhere. Keep an eye on us. <laughs> I just love that. In John 14, 12, listen, this, is driving, this drives him even crazier. In John 14, Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, whoo, You who are indwelt by the Holy Spirit will do greater works than Jesus. The believer indwelt by the Holy Spirit all over the, all over the world will result in greater works than Jesus who was limited where he went. We live in one of the greatest periods of dispensational history in the church age where greater works can be done than the period of when Christ came, came into the world. Greater works. We live in the period of greater works. Is your life involved in that greater works? Listen, greater works should be going on every week in your life. You look back and you go like, whoa, greater, greater works is going on. They're exciting. Is your life exciting? Are you engaged in greater works? Is God doing greater things through you and to you? Should be. John 14, 12, he should be. 
That's in, that's, that's in part of our, our idea. The advantage of the Holy Spirit is to your advantage. If I do not go away, the helper will not come. But if I go, I send. The second key word to me is the word advent. In John 8, 8 through 11, the advent of the Holy Spirit. And when he comes, Ercomai is an aorist active participle. The aorist tense is a his, historical point, a historical point in the plan of God. You could take a pencil and draw a line across, and an aorist tense would be a, a pencil point here. That line over there would be the sovereign eternal plan of God. And every time you have an aorist tense like this one, it's a dot on that line that's significantly important to the plan of God. That's an aorist active participle. And when he comes, the advent of the Holy Spirit is going to be just as, as, as important in the plan of God, carrying out the plan of God, as it was when Jesus was born of a woman and another dot baptized by John Another point, crucified. Another point, buried. Another point, raised from the dead. Another point, ascend back to the Father. You see, these little points, these are errors points. These, this errors point is a very important point in the great scheme of the plan of God. The coming of the Holy Spirit, the advent of the Holy Spirit. It's an active voice when he, when he comes that's the sovereign will of God. God would choose the time of it, and the time of it was Pentecost, Acts 2. Because of its Pentecost connection to the first fruits and the festival of uh, Passover unleavened bread. Well, you have to study it a little bit, people. My, my, my. You know, you got you got to put it in your head so God can put it in your heart so the Holy Spirit can recall it. And when he comes... And they have the participle as a doctrinal principle or promise, in this case promise. And when he comes, he will convict. That's a future active indicative. He's got to come first. The world, the cosmos system of sin, the cosmos system is people. John 3.16 tells us that. Of sin, of righteousness and judgment. And then he does, then he breaks it down. He says concerning sin. It should, a lot of times in the Bible, they don't say concerning. In the Greek, they do concerning sin. It's peri plus the genitive of reference. So let's take a reference to the world, the conviction of the world of sin. That's Adamic sin. Everybody's under Adamic sin. Romans 5, 12 through 21, everybody's under sin. And then he uses because that's hote, and in verse 9, it's with men, M-E-N. And th that, that's a way of connecting a series of links, one, the, a link, because you're going to see the word hote with de, D-E. Because they, the world, believe not in me. Sin. He was going to convict them of that, of not believing. Listen, you know how you're saved? You believe. You don't work. You save. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. No, you're saved by grace through faith and not of yourself. The law condemns you. Christ saves you. The gospel. And so he uses the word pistos, a present active indicative. All right? So the Holy Spirit comes in and convicts the world of sin. You, you, you need to be sure that you, you're, you're a student of Romans 5, 12 through 21. Jesus has talked about this very thing about sin uh, the, in the hostility of the world because of their sin. Because of the sin, the world becomes hostile to the gospel message of grace salvation. Oh, you can't, can't, can't say uh, uh, that's too easy. Uh, uh, this, uh, uh. I know. It wasn't easy for Jesus. And it's not easy for you. But it is grace. You're saved by grace. 
because of the work of Christ. The work is already done. The believing is what's necessary. And so in John, the 15th chapter, 18 through 27, you ought to go back and read it. said the world, because of their sin and the hostility against the gospel, which calls them out on it, their sin in Adam, the 13 judicial charges, the only way you could, that they have to be removed for you to die and go to heaven. Well, I think that's poor and narrow-minded. Well, you have to talk about that with God. It's his narrow-mindedness that did it. Yes, it's a narrow way to salvation. No man can come to the Father except through Christ. But anybody can on the basis of faith. Believing. Doesn't require you to be physically fit to, to walk an aisle. Or to, or to bring a, 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 you on a stretcher of a bed of some sort. Right where you are, you can believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried, raised from the dead, and you can be saved because you believe it. You're not going to be saved any other way. And listen, it's not how, how your body is. It's how your soul is. Those 13 judicial charges are against your soul. It's not against your body or your spirit. It's against your soul. Christ came to die for your soul. Your body will go back to the dust of the earth and your spirit will return to the Father who gave it. But your soul, that's the value of Christ on the cross, is the human soul. Concerning righteousness. Now watch what he says. And notice, hotate day. Now we're in a series that are, that are linked. Concerning sin. Now concerning righteousness. Because I, I go to the Father and you no longer see me. You need to read Romans, the fifth chapter, 12 through 21, and you need to read it really carefully. For example, he talks about the imputation of unrighteousness. One of the 13 judicial uh, charges is unrighteousness. All people are born unrighteous. There are none righteous. No, not one. In Adam. In Adam all die. They're spiritually blind. They're perishing and yada, yada. They're under the wrath of God. Not because of anything they've done, because they've been born in Adam. You need to read Paul's writings in 1 Corinthians 15. And you need to read Romans, the, 12, the fifth chapter, verses 12 through 21. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace would reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Romans 5.21. Concerning judgment. Watch this. Now, I find this to be interesting. The, this is the world now. Convicting the world of sin. Convicting the world of righteousness. You can't be righteous. 2 Corinthians 5.21. He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might be made as imputed. That's imputed righteousness on the basis of grace through faith and not of yourselves, a gift. You need, to, you need to read that, Romans 5. Because the ruler of this world, Satan, has been judged. Now, here's what's interesting. The word judged, krino, is a perfect passive indicative. It's a per perfect passive indicative. The perfect tense means completed in the past results or remains completed. When was, when, was he, when was Satan judged in the past or resulting remains future, judged throughout time and eternity? Satan's fall, Isaiah 14, uh, Ezekiel 28, when he fell. You can go to Revelation 12 and 20. That's the perfect tense. Completed in the past. With Listen, it says it here. Jesus said it here. He said, because the ruler of this world has been judged. That's a perfect passive, meaning the, the passive voice, the fall, of Satan, the fall of Satan 
and his sentence in eternity past is still on him now and will be until he is cast into the lake of fire of Revelation 20. Oh, you should read all that. You should read all that. Well, I've run out of time today. The conviction of the Holy Spirit. I've run out of time. I want to thank you for coming our way with us. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for so much. John tells me that people that watch us around the world have different time zones, and, and we're thankful that we have the, the grace of God to be able to send that to you. And whenever you hear this, uh, it could be a day later or many, many, many hours later, uh, we're so thankful. I want you to know we're so thankful that uh, you have found us on the, on, on the divine timetable and that we will be faithful to give you to the best of our ability to understand what the scriptures say about the truth that's necessary to your life to take you to a better place in Christ than you were yesterday, to give you a better foundation uh, for your spiritual growth and for your explaining to other people. Because the Holy Spirit will teach and recall. He will bring conviction within your life about who you were in the world and who you now are in Christ and be able to take that message to say this is why there is conviction of sin, of righteousness, and judgment. And listen, in Revelation 20, uh, 10 through 15, Satan is cast into the lake of fire, and so will everybody whose name is not written in the Lamb's book of life they'll be cast in that same lake of fire because you followed Satan rather than Christ. You chose not to believe. You allowed him to blind your mind so that you could not see the revelation of the light of the glory in Christ of God himself. I want to see you on the other side. There's life after death, and I want to see you there. I want to meet you. But it won't happen unless you believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried, and raised from the dead the third day. No man can get to the Father except through that. And listen, it's, it's not sitting down and Telling God about all your sins you've committed. No, 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 no. Listen, you're not going to go to hell because you commit sin. You're going to go to hell because you rejected the gospel that said that Christ died for all sin. Listen, you're a sinner because of Adam's sin. We're all sinners. We're born sinners. You're not a sinner because you sin. You sin because you're a sinner. It is different. When a sinner sins, listen, that's Norman standard. When a believer commits sin, that's not Norman standard. That's walking in the flesh. That's walking by sight. Has your life been changed? Hmm? Today is your day to believe the gospel of Jesus Christ and get born again. If you're a believer, today's the day for you to get serious about putting your head in the Word so God can put it in your heart so the Holy Spirit's got something to work with because that's where your faith, your faith base works from is the Word of God in your heart categorically taught. Conviction work of the Holy Spirit is one of those doctrines. Thank you, Father. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen.